Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending my presentation this morning. Today, I'm going to talk about the sample preparation techniques that I use in the FHS facility. Um, the ones that are different from techniques that are already available in the main CCEM facility in ABB. So specifically, that's what I want to talk about um, for sample preparation techniques are ultramicrotomy, which is thin sectioning at room temperature. Then I'm going to talk about sample processing for TEM. I'm going to follow that up with free substitution, then cryo ultramicrotomy, which as you may imagine, means thin sectioning at cold temperatures. We'll cover sample processing for SEM, which is a little bit different, critical point drying, and then positive and negative staining. So those are my topics for today. Hopefully there's something of interest there for people. So this is um, my uh, microtome that I use every day. It's like UltraCuts T. Uh, depending on sample properties, section thickness can be as thin as 40 nanometers or less, or as thick as three or more micrometers. The main parts of the microtome are um, the body of it. So this is where the work is done. And there are binoculars so that I can see what I'm doing up close, uh, especially when I'm trying to align my knife edge with the block so I don't damage anything. Then this is where the knife will go in. This is the knife assembly and there are knobs all over it so that I can finally adjust um, alignments. At the back is the arm for where the sample goes into. And again, there are adjustments there as well um, so that I can adjust the block itself. Then there's the lighting system. So lights up above and lights underneath. Then on the right hand side, you can see the control panel. So from here, I can control speeds of cutting, uh, the window length, so that's meaning where it will start to cut and where it will stop cutting. I can control the return speed so I can make it go faster if I'm finding that my day is taking too long and I want to speed things up a little bit. Um, how quickly I approach my block face with the knife assembly. Um, over here is illumination to turn lights on and off. And then the most important part is how thick or how thin I want to make my sections. And this little green button here allows me to turn on the automatic cutting. So I can sit back and just watch through the binoculars as I'm making my sections. Um, if I want to do manual cutting, then I'm using this little cutting wheel on the side here. And I just turn it, simply turn it. And every time I turn it, then it is advancing the block towards the knife by whatever I have set here in this window here. So that's currently 100 nanometers. Okay. So to be thinly sectioned at room temperature, a sample would have to be inherently hard on its own, or more likely I need to embed it in resin. For example, membrane samples such as this membrane electrode assembly that you see on the left, uh, nanowires that are on the edge of silicon nitride wafers, and then close up to see the nanowires themselves. Um, powdered samples like the silicate here, all of those things can be sectioned and also many other non-biological samples can be sectioned as long as you can successfully embed them in uh, resin and then harden that resin um, for thickness or for thin sectioning. To embed a sample in resin, you need to use an embedding mold. And there's many different versions. Um, you can even make your own if you want to. The ones at the top are all reusable. Uh, there's flat embedding molds that are made of silicone or polyethylene. There's bullet shaped molds. Uh, below you see some other types of molds which are conical shaped with flat, at, flat bottoms or pointed bottoms. The little one can be put into a centrifuge tube and spun down so that samples that are floating can be moved to the bottom. And then even gelatin capsules are used for embedding pro, uh, purposes. And then on the right hand side, you can see a couple examples of the 
samples embedded in various molds. So this would have come from one of these types of molds and it's bullet shaped. It has a nice flat bottom to it. So you can put fairly large pieces of sample in there and then um, orientate it the way you want it to be. This is just an example of using one of these small, small um, shaped molds where I had a powdered sample and I had to spin it down to bring it all down to the bottom for cutting purposes. And then this one here is one of the flat embedding molds so that you can lay a sample down and then when you're sectioning it, you'll be able to cut it from the top and get nice cross sections. Um, in addition to the molds, you'll, you'll also need some resin. And there's many different types of resins that can be used for embedding. So you can see this is white colored uh, resin. This one's darker. This one's maybe a little bit lighter. So different types of molds are different types of resins. And um, I'm not really going to talk about the different types today, except to say that um, the resin of choice is often sample dependent and um, or application dependent. So ideally, you want to try to match the hardness of resin to the sample hardness to optimize your sectioning. And you wanna to try to avoid or deliberately select certain resins for different type of analyses that you may intend to do on the sections. So for example, if you were going to do EDS analysis on some sections and you're looking for chlorine, then you wanna be sure to, make, to use a resin that is chlorine free. In the FHS facility, most samples get embedded in spurs epoxy resin because it has very low viscosity when in the liquid state. So you can get your samples in there easily. And then it has excellent cutting properties after polymerizing. Um, I use both glass knives and diamond knives for sectioning. So these are examples of glass knives here. Glass knives are prepared fresh um, as needed from long strips of glass. And we have a knife maker um, in the lab that will break this strip of glass down into triangular shapes, which have one single very sharp edge to them, hopefully if it cuts, if it breaks properly. Um, a glass knife is used for rough trimming of the sample uh, to move to remove the surface resin that's um, just covering the sample itself. So you would remove that. And then sometimes you get deeper down into the sample as well. So if what you're interested in isn't right at the surface of your sample, it's a little bit deeper in, then you would use this glass knife to do that. You can put boats on the glass knife. So you can either use metallic tape or nice plastic ones and you would just wax those on or use nail polish to stick them to the edge um, and then these can be filled up with water and so they would work exactly the same way as the diamond knives that you see on the right hand side. Um, glass knives are inexpensive. Um, they are sharp but they don't last very long. So the reason that you would flip over to these diamond knives which are much more expensive um, is because they do last a long time, if you're careful with them. So they can last for up to several years um, if great care is taken when sectioning, and then they can be resharpened as well, but they are expensive. Uh, the nice thing is that once you start cutting, you can cut and cut and cut for a long, long time, and you're not going to have to move to a new part of your knife edge like you would with glass. With glass, you'd maybe get a few sections, and then you have to move over and start again. So the different diamond knives that you're looking at here, this is called a histo knife. It has a nice large diamond edge to it. It's about eight millimeters in uh, length. And those are used for making thicker sections. So something from say 200 nanometers and up. And when I say up, I mean stopping at about maybe five microns. If you go any higher than that, then you are gonna damage that uh, knife edge. So that's what that would be used for. The one in the middle is an ultra thin knife with edge length ranging from about two and a half to four millimeters. And those are for cutting sections of 150 nanometers or thinner. And then the 
knife that's on the right hand side is a cryo diamond knife. So it has no boat for water. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about cryo sectioning shortly. When you have a block that's ready for sectioning, it gets clamped snugly. So here's my block it gets clamped snugly into this um, assembly called a chuck. And then that's placed on a trimming block and that gets put onto the microtone. And then I'm going to use a razor blade and on the left hand side, you can see this little outline of a trapezoid. I'm going to use the razor blade to trim away all the excess resin around the edges of that piece of sample that I'm interested in. And I'm being careful looking through the monocular so that I'm not going to damage the sample at all or cut away parts that I, I may actually want to look at. Then the trim block. Um, is placed into the cutting arm of the microtome and a glass knife is inserted into the knife holder. Everything's lined up using this arc of the arm to line up the um, angle of the block to the knife edge. And again, using the um, alignment knobs on the knife assembly itself to line that those angles up as well. And excess resin is cut away, as I said before, from the surface of the sample or cut a little bit deeper than that. After all this trimming is done, then you can use your histo knife if you'd like to cut a little bit thicker section. So um, maybe you can see some of these sections floating in the water here. And then this is just trying to demonstrate, it was hard to take this picture, uh, of how I would pick up these thicker sections. So I'm using a loop. And I just insert it into the boat that's filled with water and try to lift the sections out of the water um, onto my loop. And then those sections are transferred to a glass slide and dried down. And then they can be looked at in a light microscope so that you can see where you are on, on your section or on your sample to see if you're actually sectioning through the part that you're interested in or if you have to go a little bit deeper still. And then once you've verified that you're actually in a good area of the block, that's uh, what you're looking for, then you switch out your knife a third time. And now you're onto your thin sectioning knife. And this is where precise alignments need to be done so that you're not going to damage that very thin knife edge. And you make some nice thin sections. So again, you can see a few sections floating on the water. These are the sections that I'm going to pick up for TEM. And so this is trying to demonstrate how I would do that. Um, I have a stick here and on the end of the stick is an eyelash. In my other hand is my forceps holding a grid. I insert the grid into the water and then I use the eyelash while I'm looking through the binoculars, of course to herd those very thin sections and those sections if you if I go back one page they look um very silver or golden in color those would be 80 to 100 nanometer sections um, I'm trying to herd those onto the surface of my grid and then ultimately um, we'll have multiple sections or at least one large section in the center of my grid um, beside my microtome is another microtome called an Ultra Cut E microtome. It's very similar to the one I use, just a little bit older. And this can be used for training purposes. Once um, COVID eases up a bit, hopefully it will, um, then I'd love to have people come and train if they'd like to. Um, you'll be using glass knives. That's how everyone learns to section before they advanced to diamond. So you would be using glass just like I did many years ago. So what I've been talking about so far is um, sectioning of non-biological samples that can simply be put into resin, hardened, sectioned. Uh, but biological specimens such as tissue samples, um, so pieces of muscle, pancreas, kidney, even mouse eyeballs, which I've sectioned before, um, or even bacteria and viruses that are in culture media can be put through a processing um, series 
and then um, sectioned later on. So this is a very nice flow chart from Bazola and Russell. Um, so at the beginning, specimen acquisition. So you're taking whatever sample you're interested in, and then you're cutting down to get to the pieces that are of most importance to you. Um, the biological specimens have to be fixed in an appropriate fixative solution as soon as possible after collection because they will start to degrade right away. Ideally, the fixative should preserve the structure of the specimen at the point that it was introduced into the fixative, and then it should protect the specimen from structural changes during the remaining processing steps and ultimately during the exposure to the electron beam. Some fixatives are better than others for certain types of samples um, or for preservation of specific ultrastructure features. And so this should all be considered beforehand before you start collecting your specimens. A common fixative protocol and one that I um, use routinely is a two-step procedure for fixation. So you would start with EM grade um, glutaraldehyde and usually I use a 2% in an appropriate buffer. Um, glutaraldehyde is exceptionally good at cross-linking proteins and other cell components. And um, most often people will bring their samples to me in the glutaraldehyde so that I can continue their processing for them. Um, but if you were to do it yourself, you would want to at least leave your sample in the fixative for two hours, which is typical or overnight, or sometimes even longer if you want to store up a few, um, but it's not to be stored in, in the fixative for an extended period of time. So after fixation in aldehyde, then we're going to wash with buffer and then use the secondary fixative. And the secondary fixative is called osmium tetroxide and usually used as a 1% solution in the same appropriate buffer. Osmium tetroxide reacts strongly with lipids or other unsaturated bonds in cell components. And it also provides some contrast in the tissues. That's helpful later on during EM imaging. Usually you leave your sample in this osmium for about an hour. Then after this fixation step is finished, um, we move on to dehydration. And so in this dehydration stage, the water is slowly replaced by increasing increments of solvent. So for example, ethanol in increasing concentrations, I normally start at 50% and then two 70% and then a couple 95% followed by a few more 100%. Final dehydration is done with propylene oxide and this is to replace the ethanol. And then this propylene oxide, which is just a super strong solvent, um, is used to assist you with infiltrating in the resin. And this also is a gradual increase. So you would start with um, maybe two to one propylene oxide to resin and then increase to one to one and then one to two and then 100% resin, 100% resin a couple times. Samples are usually placed on a rotator during this stage where you have your mixtures of propylene oxide and, and um, resin so that you're ensuring that they're, they're mixing continuously. After the second change in 100% um, resin, then, and that's usually for at least an hour of just mixing in the 100%, then you can put your specimens into your molds and then cover those with fresh resin again, and those get placed in, sorry, <laughs> those get placed into a 60 degree oven overnight to polymerize. For most sample types, this whole process from top to bottom can be done over a 24 to 48 hour period, but there are exceptions where you may want to increase the increments, um, the duration, if you're having trouble with your fixations. Sorry to have done that. Um, examples of sample types that I section uh, would be on the left, muscle tissues. This would be from probably mouse, but it could also be human as well. Uh, cell monolayers 
or cells themselves, bacterial cultures. And then this colored image on the right hand side is of uh, through an entire small nerve. Um, it's from human and it's a thick section. So to give you an idea of what you can see with the thicker section, so this would be about one micron. The reason that it's blue is because after the section was made, it was stuck into um, a histochemical stain called toluidine blue. And that's just a general stain that gives you a uh, good detail of the cell structure. And we commonly use monitor sections like this to tell us where we are in our section so that we can pick out if we were looking for something specific. We'll be able to see it at the light level and then we know that we can make the thin sections and we'll find it again in the TEM. So that's processing. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is free substitution. So even though chemical fixation, which I've just finished talking about, um, does an excellent job of quickly penetrating and fixing samples, um, there are cases where it may be more appropriate to rapidly freeze a sample. <laughs> oh no. Um, so in, so there may be cases where it's more appropriate to freeze a sample. So like by high pressure freezing or plunge freezing in order to ensure that diffusible molecules are kept in place. Um, after rapid freezing, the samples can be maintained at low temperatures in a freeze substitution, like what you're looking at on the left. And essentially what you're seeing here is just a big liquid nitrogen doer. On top of that is a chamber where the samples will go in. And then on this right hand side is a control panel. The frozen samples get placed into an appropriate type of holder. Um, and this is a pre-chilled chamber so that you're taking your frozen sample and you're keeping it frozen. And inside those pre-chilled vials, then you may have a mixture of a solvent and um, a chemical fixative. So maybe um, acetone and some osmium tetroxide. And um, the sample's placed on top of that frozen mixture. Then you close up your, you seal up your chamber. And then on the right hand side, you have the ability to um, set up programs. The working temperature range of the Leica system goes from minus 140 Celsius to plus 65 Celsius. And using the programs, you're allowed to set three holding temperatures, so here, here, and here, and then there are two gradual increasing increments in between those so that you're slowly heating up your samples. Um, you can actually run several programs, one right after the other, so it can be a very gradual increase in the temperature. And eventually the samples brought up back up to room temperature and can be infiltrated with resin. So the purpose of this is just to do a very, to freeze instantaneously those, um, those diffusible molecules and then just slowly uh, fix them in place so that um, they will be in a more natural state. So that's an option um, of something that you can do in the facility. Next, cryo-ultramicrotomy, which is, as I said, sectioning under cold conditions. And this is a picture of the uh, cryo-ultramicrotome that's in the lab. It works essentially the same way as the ultramicrotome, but it uses liquid nitrogen, which is just off to the side here, to cool to temperatures as cold as minus 170 degrees Celsius. The chamber is, is here on the left-hand side. Um, this is where the sample will go in. And this is your knife um, assembly here. 
This particular model allows you to have two knives placed into the chamber at once. So I often have a glass knife placed here with my diamond knife here, and I can switch back and forth without, without having to remove the whole thing and warming it back up and then uh, putting it back in again. The control panel on the right has similar controls to the ultra microtome, so you can control your speed of cutting, you can control your thickness as well, uh, but you also have the ability to control temperature and you can control the temperature on the sample, on the knife assembly, and then the overall chamber. If you wish to create to cryosection samples like biological tissues that are sensitive to freezing, then they may require pre-soaking in cryopreservatives such as sucrose prior to being rapidly plunge frozen onto cryopins. The frozen samples are then placed in that pre-cooled chamber over here. Um, sectioning is done with glass and diamond knives and can, the sections can be kept frozen so that you can look at them in a cryo TEM. So you would transfer the sections on grids out of this chamber, um, put them into some kind of transfer device and then into the cryo TEM. Or the grids can be allowed to room up to um, warm up to room temperature and then rinsed off with water to remove any cryo protectants. And then those are ready for imaging. And examples of sample types that I have cryosectioned um, include polymer mixtures like these ones and then hydrogels as well. Not so much biological, but um, it can be done. So um, we've been talking about samples mostly for TEM. But if you want to look at the same types of samples in a conventional SEM to study the surface mor morphology, um, what do you do then? If a sample doesn't have too much water, um, then you may get away with air drying or quick freezing in, and then freeze drying that. So examples like that would be something with a hard outer, outer shell, like an insect maybe, or seeds. Um, so you may get a, some decent images from doing that. However, if you were to simply dry a wet sample, like a piece of animal tissue, um, then the high surface tensions placed on the sample as water passes from a liquid to a gas would cause a lot of distortion to the structure of the sample. Therefore, on biological samples, exactly the same initial steps would be done as for TEM protocols. So you would start with your fixation uh, with glutaraldehyde and osmium tetroxide, tetroxide to maintain the cell structure. And then you would move on to dehydration to remove the water that would disrupt your vacuum and imaging. Um, and then instead of continuing into your resin, in this case, your final step is to put the samples into a critical point dryer. And before I show you what that is, I first need to explain what is critical point. So critical point is a set of conditions where the liquid and gas phases of a substance are not distinguishable. And at this point, a liquid, a liquid can transfer to a gas stage, gas state without high surface tension, and that, that prevents damage to the sample structure. So if you look at the table below, you can see that the temperature and pressure required to get water to its critical point are actually way too high to sustain cell structure. Even common dehydrating agents like ethanol and acetone have temperatures um, at critical point temperatures that are much too high to maintain cell structure. But a substance like liquid carbon dioxide has critical point values that make it an ideal substance for drying. And the nice thing about liquid CO2 is that it easily replaces these solvents like ethanol or acetone that are used during the dehydration stage. Um, so you can easily replace them with the CO2. So hopefully I've now explained what critical point 
um, actually means, and then we can continue with the processing steps. So once our, C, our SEM image samples are dehydrated in 100% ethanol, then they're kept wet in ethanol and transferred into a porous basket. So there's, there are very many kinds of porous baskets. These are just some that I have in the lab. Um, this one would be for cover slips. So you can put multiple cover slips into this type of basket here. Um, four samples here, multiple samples. Uh, this one down here is for millipore filters or even grids. The reason that you would put them into a basket is that these holders give some protection to the delicate surfaces while they're in the dryer. And they also allow you to put more than one sample in at once so you can keep track of where your samples are going. So often I'll put a little piece of paper um, with a number or something into the bottom of the basket so I know where to start doing my um, keeping track of, of samples. Then those baskets get transferred into the chamber of the critical point dryer here. And you can put several baskets on top of each other because they all do have openings that allow um, transfer of solutions through them. This chamber is pre-cooled before you put the samples in. And then once you've got your samples in there, you cover them up with enough 100% ethanol just to just cover them. Then you seal up this chamber and you slowly flush it using the control panel over on the right hand side. You slowly flush it more than 10 times with liquid CO2 in order to remove the ethanol from the samples and the chamber. After final fill of the chamber with liquid CO2, the chamber is heated gradually and up to 35 degrees Celsius. And this will cause the pressure in the chamber to rise and it will rise to a maximum of 79 bar so that the critical point of CO2 is reached. And finally, the CO2 gas is slowly vented. And while you're venting the CO2 gas, um, you maintain your temperature of 35 degrees Celsius. So this prevents the gas from returning to a liquid state while the chamber is slowly coming back up to atmospheric pressure. And in this way, the biological samples can be gently dried to minimize your drying effects as much as possible. Uh, this is the picture of the whole critical point dryer that we have available in the lab. You can see uh, the CO2, liquid CO2 tank is here. Um, this little bottle on the side is a res reservoir that captures uh, the fluids as you're flushing th um, them through your chamber, they're collected here. So I just wanted to give you an example of something that uh, give you an idea of how well it does. So this is just a piece of stem that I collected from outside and um, I did put this in fixative and then I rinsed it off at the end of the fixation and I just allowed it to air dry. And you can see the effects of that. Then this is a, another piece of the exact same stem and this one was fixed and then dehydrated through all the series of dehydration steps and then again air dried. And you can see the effects. Maybe it's slightly better, but not too much improvement. This is actually uh, quite evident that the critical point dryer does a very good job of um, of drawing the sample down with minimal damage to the sample itself. So this is exactly the same piece of stem, just cut into three different pieces, and you can see that it did do a good job. Other examples of things that I've used critical point dryer to dry down would be cells such as this macrophage cell, uh, components of blood, and this is just a fibrin clot of blood, or biofilms as well. So there's many options. It's endless what you can put in there. Hydrogels as well. Sometimes um, if they can withstand some of the pressure and not fall apart, then you can dry those as well in there. So we 
come to positive staining. Um, when you're processing and sectioning biological tissues for TEM, they tend to have very little natural contrast, unless there was some sort of mineral deposit or crystal in the tissue itself. Uh, the osmium tetroxide that we use in the processing will provide a little bit of contrast for some components of the cell. And what you're looking at here is pancreatic tissue, both, uh, both images. This one on the left was processed without osmium uh, for a specific purpose at the time. And then the one in the beside on the right hand side does have some osmium. And you can see that there is some increase in the contrast there. Uh, but to optimize imaging, we want to try and increase that contrast even more using other heavy metal stains. So there are two stains used in the lab for positive staining of sections, and um, they are called lead acid, um, urinal acetate and lead citrate. And then this is an example of the exact same tissue with the additional um, stains used on that. Um, Maybe it's not quite as evident to you from these pictures that it did a good job, but I assure you, it does do a good job. It's worth the extra time to do them um, because it's kind of a finicky thing. And so you, you wouldn't want to do it unless you had to. And it does do a good job of increasing your contrast. So urinal acetate stains membranes, nucleic acids, and proteins. Lead citrate stains lipids and proteins, and it tends to attract to areas that pick up more osmium during the fixation. A typical staining procedure would be five minutes in the urinal acetate. Uh, just by placing your grid on a drop of urinal acetate, you would cover it so that it's not exposed to light for that five minutes because it will precipitate in light. Then you thoroughly water rinse that grid off and you dry it with a little bit of. Um, filter paper. Then you follow this up with a two-minute exposure to a drop of the lead citrate. And in this case, you put it into a petri plate that has some NaOH pellets around, um, around the outside of it so that you are inhibiting um, CO2 that's coming from your breath or from the air. And um, because this will also cause the lead to precipitate. Then after that two minutes, you're going to water rinse again, and then you're just going to dry it a little bit, and you're ready to go, and you're ready to look at your, your sections in the TEM. Occasionally, you can use um, fumes from osmium tetroxide or ruthenium tetroxide uh, to stain certain things, and these are both very strong oxidizers. And so you would expose your sections to the fume. So just a few drops around the outside edge of your P3 plate, uh, put your grid in there, and then close the lid up and come back a little bit later. And hopefully you've picked up some of the heavy stain and it will expose certain features of this, in this case, polymer and these features, these small rod-like um, structures here, which could not be visible otherwise. Then finally, negative staining. Um, so instead of staining that's reacting with components of the sample tr to create contrast, in negative staining, the stain surrounds the outer limits of the sample to provide contrast. So this dark stuff in here that you see. So it's not used on section samples, but rather on whole structures. And examples that I'm showing today are collagen fibers. So it's pooling around the outside edges and even allowing you to see some of that banding structure. You would use it for bacteria to look at flagella and pili um, that are very thin. Uh, the, set, the image in the middle is of virus particles and those are tobacco mosaic viruses. You could use it on particles or liposomes, and um, on the far right is cellulose nanocrystals. So all the types of things like that that don't have very much contrast, um, increased contrast around them so that you can visualize them in the microscope. 
So to just finish up today, I'm going to show you the two microscopes that I have available for use in the lab. Uh, this is the Joel 1200EX TEM with an AMT meg 4 megapixel digital camera on the side of it. The microscope is very user friendly and introduction of the sample rod is quick, which is nice. The microscope is typically operated at 80 kV, which provides good stability and contrast for biological samples, but other kV settings are possible. It doesn't get heavily used, so it might be a good option for those interested in imaging up to 500,000 times. And then there is a test scan variable pressure scanning electron microscope in the facility. The microscope has an Oxford EDS detector and Inca software. There's a backscatter detector on there that can be used simultaneously with the secondary electron detector. You can uh, view non-conductive samples using the variable pressure mode of the microscope, whereas conductive samples or samples that have been coated with metal are viewed using the conventional high vacuum mode. Here's my list of references or suggested readings for today. Um, I can email that to you if you like, just send me an email and I'll be happy to email it to you. So thank you for your attention today. I hope I've provided you with some useful information that you might be able to use to assist you in imaging your own samples. As you can see, there's many things to consider when preparing biological samples for EM, um, I always suggest starting with a literature search on similar sample types to find protocols that have worked in the past. Great way to start. And I'm always available to help you and discuss your specific samples. And my contact information is on the screen for you. So thank you very much. Can you clarify the role of high pressure freezing in the free substitution workflow? Does it come first and is HPF available? Okay, uh, it, no, it's not available any longer. Unfortunately, I did have an HPF in the facility, but uh, due to space constraints, it was taken away. Um, but it would come first. So high pressure free freezing um, is ideal, but you can also do plunge freezing and there is a slam freezer that's available in the facility. So one of those two options is still available and that would come first. And then you take your frozen sample and you would put it into the, um, the free substitution unit to finish off your protocol. Hope that explains it. <laughs>